our next presenter, who I have to give a little bit of kudos and shout out to, um, because when the STEM Leadership Alliance started, it started with um, Al Byers, uh, who you're going to hear from next, um, and David Barnes over at NCTM and Sal Fernandez, who, where we had a conversation starting to talk about what would integrated STEM really look like and how do we make that shift there. And it started off on a napkin. And I look at to where we are today, and it's been the leadership of, of these individuals here that have really helped to move us um, forward. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Al Byers, who I'm just a huge fan of. So Al, go ahead and take it away, and thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly. What a wonderful introduction. I do remember that napkin. It was a beautiful venue. We were at the Portofino at Universal Studios, and um, yeah, I'm so excited to be part of this. And thank you. And and uh, gosh, Sal Fernandez and Rosa, I just left Roy. You have a great team in the background that pulls this stuff off. So I'm excited for the next 30 minutes. And I will go ahead and turn my uh, present on, select my screen here, application window, to put it in full present mode. And we'll, we'll launch this thing. So, uh, and I have one embedded video, so I'll take a chance and see how that sounds when we get to it. But uh, so the next 30 minutes, I'm going to discuss structuring sustainable STEM learning experiences for middle school teachers and students. Uh, my name is Al Byers, as Kelly gave me that introduction. I'm currently an assistant professor and visiting scholar in STEM education at the Virginia Commonwealth University uh, School of Education, and I lead the Center for Innovation in STEM Education. So um, if I've, I've just been told that um, if you want these handouts, they're so proficient, they've already got, I made a PDF version of these slides minus the video that's embedded. And if you click the handouts in the lower, I guess the left vert nav menu, you'll be able to have a PDF with these. So all the links we have right now as well. So uh, here's the obligatory slide for our Center for Innovation and in STEM Education. And um, I'm located in Richmond, Virginia. And the surrounding um, school districts are where I try to bring high impact STEM experiences to the highest need students and the teachers who serve them. And so that's Richmond City Public Schools, uh, Eastern Henrico County Public Schools, Chesterfield County Public Schools, Petersburg City Public Schools, Colonial Heights Public Schools, Hopewell. There is a lot, a ton of um, high need that we can reach out to and leverage the assets and resources of VCU. So if you want to learn more about that center, there's a URL there. Uh, we were part of a statewide grant with five universities. Uh, it was UVA, George Mason University, James Madison University, Virginia Tech, and Virginia Commonwealth University. And we just released, we're developing, we're in the move on Virginia. I don't know if we're ahead, but I don't know if we're behind, but you can learn from others that have been before you. And so we actually have a STEM commission. I serve on that in the governor's office, and we're developing a STEM network across the state. So we have a white paper that was just released across those five universities if you're interested. And if you want to learn more about that, here's the plug. Uh, Thursday, I think it's at 11 o'clock a.m., Thursday the 16th, I have a 30-minute chat. And I've got maybe just 10 slides, but it's not a long talk. It's to answer your questions, but it's going to talk about all the initiatives that our center is doing in the region um, of Richmond. So with, with that, who is this guy talking to you? Um, I was a middle school educator at Robius Middle School in Chesterfield County, Virginia. Many years ago, there is a picture of my sixth grade, sixth grade classroom. I taught sixth and eighth grade physical science. And why are we doing all this? All the wonderful conversations and expertise that Kelly is bringing together and people that are attending. If you look at that lower right-hand screen, if we can get those students, right? If we can instill that desire to learn, spark their curiosity, their inquisitiveness. When that mouth drops like that, man, they are in full receive mode, right? That's the aha moments that we try to, and we live for in teaching. Uh, as I was teaching, I got into space science and astronomy a little bit. I spent a summer out of Berkeley where I learned that NASA hired aerospace education specialists. So I had a gig at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center for three years where I did student programming. I was fortunate enough to compete. I, I am not an astronaut, have not been in space, but I did compete and got to fly experiments. Uh, aboard the KC-135. Uh, they affectionately call that the Vomit Comet, and it does live up to its name. And then I would do teacher professional learning uh, workshops across the Northeast, as well as hands-on activities with students. Um, for the last 16 years, I've been at the National Science Teachers Association. I served as uh, many roles over that time uh, as associate executive director over a couple divisions. And then the last two and a half years, 
I've been at VCU and I've really enjoyed that. So that's who I am. Let's get into what we're going to do for this session. Um, so structuring sustainable STEM learning experiences. What I'm going to do is talk about, um, there's about three or four actual grants I'm working on, but one I'm going to use to highlight that theme. The title of the grant is called BIVALS. Uh, BIVALS is Ecosystem Sustaining Treasures, or the acronym BEST in Bay Watersheds. And this is part of a three-year NOAA BWET grant. And BWET stands for uh, Bay Watershed Education and Training. It's a great model they have. It's uh, very much aligned to NGSS, three-dimensional learning, inquiry-based learning, but they call it Meaningful Watershed Educational Experiences. I'm working with four school districts, two urban. Um, you'll see a video that will highlight them. If not, I'll call them out in two rural. It's upriver and downriver along the James River. And we're looking at the role that mussels and oysters play in sustaining those ecosystems. Um, I was in physical science and astronomy, space science. So I will tell you, as I was working as PI on the grant, I had wonderful help with our partners, both in the College of Education and the VCU Life Sciences, the Center for Environmental, uh, Center for Environmental Science and the VCU Rice River Center. Here's a fun story as people were being very humble as they, as they are, because no one knows at all. I'm learning about the role bivalves play. I think I know STEM, I know teacher professional learning, I know science standards, and, and I know inquiry, but, but I wasn't in the subject matter content area of bivalves. And so as I'm working on a proposal, and it's a team, I was getting feedback, um, Dr. James Vonish, one of our co-PIs in life sciences said, you know, I really like where you're going with this, but uh, muscles uh, has, uh, the muscles you're talking about live on your body, not in the water. And so I, cause it does, it wasn't a spelling error in, in, in the word doc, so it was pretty funny that um, I had, I'm still learning about the role by those places. We're all our lifelong learners and it's been a great experience for me. So I'm gonna talk about this. This is my worst slide. It's, the, it's an eye chart almost. There's only one more kind of like this. There's the URL at the bottom, um, but what I'll do is quickly review. It probably makes sense to talk about, well, if you haven't heard about NOAA BWET grants, what is a meaningful watershed educational experience? But you'll see the inquiry and the NGHS alignment, the 3D stuff here. Um, the first thing, issue definition. So the students, part of the, the process with this grant, there was a lot of conversation with these four districts, with the STEM coordinators before the grant was ever submitted. And they didn't force students to join, teachers got to volunteer and opt in. Um, but ultimately what they do is students get to focus on their own driving question that addresses a locally relevant environmental issue or problem. Um, that requires further background or research. And so once they identify that problem, they have to go out into the field. I literally, in the grant, we put funds aside as needed, and I can talk more about that and how we sustain it beyond the life of the grant, but they go out into the field. They make observations, they collect data, um, they conduct other activities like water quality samples and things to answer their questions and drive their future actions. Ultimately, they bring that back to the classroom and they draw synthesis and conclusions. So if you think about the eight science and engineering practices, you can see where they make claims about their issue. They use that data, the argument driven investigations and inquiry to support their claims as evidence. And they present that both uh, crosstalk between the schools, between students and students and to external audiences. Um, I think it was really cool when Kelly said yesterday, I heard her say, you know, I used to call it P3 learning, right? Phenomena based, problem based, project based. And there, there's nuances, right? Each is unique. But I think the, the trifecta, when you can triangulate and align all three. And so here, students are looking at a phenomena problem. And I'll give you some examples in, in this grant. And that helps them identify a real problem. And then from that problem, they come up with projects. Many are engineering designed or process based for solutions to improve the problem. So when you can align those three, that is part of the sustainability and the deeper learning. Um, so the thing that makes this really unique is the stewardship and civic action. That is what I haven't seen often in many uh, projects and efforts. So once they get to this effort and they learn what the problem is and they go out and collect the data, they then design a project, uh, an environmental action project that, that is, the, is a push. It's a little bit of a stretch. They brainstorm and they implement that to improve their community. And I'll give you three different examples from um, of the four districts that we have time for today. So that's what a MIWI is, and that's part of sustainability and deeper learning, when students have ownership and autonomy and input into the process. But they can't go wherever, they, wherever willy-nilly they want to go, right? Teachers help scaffold that and put bounded autonomy with standards aligned, what's cognitively and grade appropriate 
for the science standards they're supposed to be learning anyway, of course. That's the, the nuance. So in one slide, this is the entire three-year project. It, it's, it's a 15-page type proposal with Gantt charts and timelines and budgets. But in, in a nutshell, this effort looks – it has a blended teacher professional learning experience. It has on-site and online. Teachers spend several days, and they camp out overnight at the D.C. Rice River Center. Um, that's where the professional learning starts. And then there's webinars. We have an online community portal, the NSTA Learning Center, where we do webinars and moderate asynchronous discussion. And we also go out into the schools about once every three to four weeks. We're out in the schools. I'll talk more about that later. Um, there's standards aligned to curriculum. So it's a NOAA grant. So we use the hands-on inquiry lessons. They were called Oysters in the Chesapeake Bay. And kind of one of the extra um, sustainability parts here is we tie that to locally relevant, authentic storylines along the James River, upriver and downriver, Newport News, New Kent County Public Schools, Charles City County Public Schools, and then Colonial Heights, which is a city right across from um, Richmond City Public Schools. I said we follow up with the visits. Um, what's a little unique, it's not just myself or our education specialists in the School of Education that go and visit the schools. Um, we have graduate students, and it's it's an opportunity for them, uh, and they're in the College of Life Sciences. They're getting a master's degree in environmental science, and they go out as well, and they're kind of younger. Um, they're diverse. We have an African-American female and a Caucasian male, and they go out into the schools regularly, and they plan with the students. They help install oyster and mussel tanks, whatever the teacher wants. It's like free it is, well, it, it costs some funds, but it's, it's an aid. There's no impact for the schools. And it's a great win-win uh, for the graduate students and the, the public schools and VCU, of course. And then the last bullet, the implementation is a three-year grant. In year one, we're working with all sixth grade students. It's a team of teachers at the middle school, but that's part of the buy-in from the STEM coordinator at the district level and the principal. Um, every student will participate in the MEWI for grade six, Year two, we do grade seven. And then in year three, it's still yet to be determined. We have to support the prior grades uh, when we go out in successive years. The Stewardship Action Project grows uh, across the school. And so we have yet to determine, are we gonna scale it up to eighth grade or we just continue to grow at six or seven? We have a third party evaluator, we collect data, and then we iterate over time in terms of how it needs to grow. So here's a video. Um, this was, I'm going to, hopefully this plays. I've got this monitor on a separate laptop and it looks like it's going to work. Um, this is an NSF uh, 2020 STEM for All video showcase video. And in your handouts, I put the URLs there. So a quick tangent, there were over 770 submissions for the NSF STEM for All video showcase this year. Um, and they're federally funded STEM grants. It's K-16, but you can easily search by K-12 or middle school or by subject matter topic. And it's a neat way to see innovation, what other people are doing in STEM. You have the URL in the handout and um, you can network, build collaborations. They even have a multiplex URL now that um, goes across even prior years. It's managed by Turk. So, so with that said, here's a three minute video that if you had to leave the conversation after this, you wouldn't want to miss this piece of it. I mean, let's hope it plays. The K-12 frameworks for science education suggest deeper learning occurs as students explore phenomena that is relevant to their daily lives. When kids ask their own driving questions and design investigations to answer those questions, they are intrinsically motivated. Deeper understanding occurs as students engage in hands-on science practices using their own data as evidence to support their claims through student discourse. NOAA education efforts support a learning approach called a MIWI, a meaningful watershed educational experience that engages students in a similar manner. MIWIs charge students to implement a local stewardship action project derived from an environmental issue informed by their field study. Many would agree these approaches spark student curiosity, but are easier said than done. And our NOAA grant will share how we support middle school teachers working with urban and rural audiences along the James River, developing authentic storylines relevant to issues challenging bivalve ecosystems provides a compelling narrative for students to showcase their action projects at the Virginia State Capitol. Our effort is a collaboration between the VCU School of Education, the VCU Center for Environmental Studies, the VCU Rice River Center, and the Harrison Lake National Fish Hatchery. 
We planned with our partner school districts in Charles City, Colonial Heights, New Kent, and Newport News, Virginia. Teacher Professional Learning supported the application of NOAA lessons and the MeWe. Content knowledge from the BCU Environmental Scientist and hands-on lessons from BCU School of Education ensured a student-driven approach to learning. Storyline themes include threatened, endangered, and invasive species and sustaining oyster and mussel ecosystems, providing experiences that increase teacher competence and confidence through content knowledge and first-hand experience conducting field studies ensured effective translation for the classroom. To sustain the effort, BCU graduate students and education experts made on-site school visits. We provided an online community platform, transportation funds, and many grants to remove implementation barriers. The teachers did a tremendous job implementing the environmental student lessons. Student field studies collected data on the water quality for later analysis to determine their action projects. Projects have not been completed yet, but are being planned across the following areas. Students shared infographics of their efforts today at the Capitol. Scheduling student teams to meet with their representatives took careful planning, but the payoff was tremendous. Student learning that moves beyond the classroom, out into the environment, is powerful and authentic. Couple that to a local issue addressed through action and having their projects recognized by their representatives, priceless. So um, I hope that came through the audio. I think it did because I heard it on my computer and I saw it on the uh, login as a user screen. So let me, I'm cognizant of my time. Let me keep going and then we'll have some Q&A too at the end for a couple of questions that needed. And you can enter those in the chat if desired. Um, and I have one question for you all that'll look at the chat. So get ready to hit that discuss button. So authentic storylines. Let me give you a couple examples how I try to, great, thank you, Dave, how I try to tie together um, the phenomena to the problems to the solutions, the engineering design pieces and things. So Oysters in the Chesapeake Bay, that's a series of modules. We looked at the middle school level. Um, they have one lesson called Then and Now, and it looked at historical perspectives of John Smith's travels. Students were supposed to notice change over time surrounding the Chesapeake Bay and the role that oysters played in it. You couple that with the Chesapeake Bay interpretive buoy system, and you can locally go to the Jamestown site and in near real time, you can look at the data and they can ground truth that against their own collection of data, either at the James or a tributary or a stream that feeds right into the James. So things like salinity, turbidity, O2. And then you say um, the lower, so you can do a stewardship action project, which could be a Virginia oyster shell re recycling program. And Newport News is actually doing that. Um, they're making cages, they're, being, they're given spat, they're going in kayaks, made over a hundred of these. You put them in these, uh, I guess I call them cages. There's probably a better name for it, but, and that's where they grow these things. And then they dump them back into these sanctuaries. Now, what's really wild is if you look at the picture on the bottom, you're gonna see an oyster from today and they have a growth span of about five years. It takes about three years if you're even gonna harvest an oyster for commercialism, if you're gonna eat it versus a sanctuary. The picture on the right is an oyster. If you look at paleontology or archaeology, those oysters lived for 25 years. And just like trees and tree rings for how old they are, you can determine that by the rings. You can almost visualize them on the side of the oyster as they grow each year. So questions become, this is in their backyard. They're, these things, you know, it's along the chains where they are. You say, well, why aren't the oysters that big now? And if they only grow for five years, what, you know, what's happening to them? And how do we know that they were that big that long ago? Well, in Jamestown, they, as you archeology, as you dig up these pits, these were their trash cans. They didn't have the trash truck drive by, but they had trash. So they dug these holes in their colony and then they just bury it. And as you excavate it and dig it up over time, you see these very old type of oysters. So that right there is, is, is very intrinsic when they can tie kind of these phenomena to problems, to challenges, to how they can help restore and maintain the oyster population through recycling. Here's one more example. Um, this is from lesson three and lesson six, land use in water and oyster harvest simulations. And here again, they look at water quality, but they use NOAA resources. They can look at point source pollution and urban and suburban pollution by zip code. And one of the schools, again, they can ground truth their data. The school in Colonial Heights um, is in a city 
and the Appomattox River is literally the the the, um, the Appomattox feeds right into the James at Colonial Heights. It's the widest part of the Appomattox tributary to the James, and there are several industrial, commercial, chemical plants there. And so they are taking water quality testing measurements above river, above the plant, and below river. And so um, kind of cool, right? And seeing if there's any change and how they're protecting the water and for, w with what the plant's doing. And this is really wild. I gotta share the power of this story. So in Virginia, there is a balance of conservation, the sanctuaries when the environmentalist versus the watermen who care about the commercial aquaculture industry in Virginia. It's like $80 million a year. So just like the farmers with agriculture, they are planting these oyster harvesting and they sell them. We eat oysters evidently in Virginia and uh, whether they're raw or, or fried or whatever. And so there can even be natural environmental hazards. Two years ago, there was an excessive event in weather where we had the highest rain in Virginia over the last 10 years. So put your thinking caps on. Here's the teachable moment for you guys. If you have tons and tons, the highest rain over 10 years, record setting in Virginia, what do you think that would do to the brackish line in the James River, right? All that fresh water coming down from the mountains flows down the James and the brackish lines where the salt and fresh water meet. What do you think it's going to do? It's going to push it down. I love, I love this history, civic, science, and math. Thanks, Dave. I'm just glancing at the chat but it's gonna push that brackish water level down more closer towards the Chesapeake Bay. And guess what? The aquaculture, the watermen, they have farms um, that were in, that the, they were no longer in the brackish line and oysters need three years to harvest and they need a certain level of salinity. They were, um, they were hurting, the industry suffered. You imagine waiting three years to harvest a crop and then you lose it. And so they were petitioning the Virginia capital and the um, Agricultural and Conservation Committee working group and saying, we wanna harvest the sanctuaries. And I can look up at Virginia State and there is this working group and you read the notes and the notes say, we have to come up with a decorum where we can have civic discourse between the watermen and the environmentalists. Now that's all they said in these notes I read, but imagine, so what that means, now we don't wanna encourage kids to do this, but there needs to be a balance. And so they probably weren't talking very nice to one another. And they were saying, "We, how can we, can we just once have a precedent and uh, harvest the sanctuaries? And so you could have a virtual role play simulation where students are assigned to these different roles, take the positions and argue them after they research them. And then they can explore their own roles and agendas. It's a rich learning opportunity. Um, and there's actually tools that help help you set up those types of role play simulations. And you can get into engineering. You say, well, if you're gonna harvest the sanctuary once, and guess what? The oysters in the Chesapeake Bay have lessons about designing harvesting for oysters. And there's different techniques and they have different levels of impact. So really cool stuff. I got into that, I got about seven minutes left, so we're doing okay. So I'd love to look at the chat and say, what sustainable implementation strategies did you pick up or might you suggest? And I'll glance at these just for a moment, and then I'm going to put up the money slide, the one slide with all the suggestions and some awesome examples of that will close out. Similar project in New York City, Austin, billion oyster project. Okay, so um, we had to sidebar, but remote learning, yes, um, that's what we're planning for this year when the th four districts school plans come out in Virginia. We're going to have to look at... Um, Iowa State, Iowa, University of Iowa has, if you type Google, Iowa Ecosystems and um, Watersheds, there is a virtual simulation that lets you vary crop density and the types of crops, and it looks at its impact with runoff from an agricultural point of view on ecosystems. So that's a neat simulation if they can't go out into the field. And then we're looking at a role play simulation. Uh, the gentleman is a professor out of the University of Australia and he's got, it's flat loosely as the platform, but basically you set up a rich case, you have authentic roles that kids can actually look up and assume those roles. So we're gonna try, I hope we don't have to move completely online, but we're looking at some online types of um, engagement. So thank you, Dave. Yes, the, um, so let me keep, let me go right ahead. This is the money slide. I'm gonna stop for one minute and let you read all, I think these are all points that help work towards sustainability and I'll read it with you.
So I think one of the, the largest things, um, let me give you a couple examples. I learned this at NSTA. Um, I think they're called one of those uh, memorable moments that, that Chip Heath was talking about where Kelly replayed that presentation. We make sure that we put a lot of photos and articles and Flickr albums, and you saw the video. Um, we highlight what the districts are doing. I think as, as educators, we're so humble. We are focused on student learning and inspiring the next generation. We care about our effort and our subject matter, and we don't share it too much. But if you want to sustain efforts, especially if they need uh, fiscal support or just buy-in with local corporations, they care about that visibility in their portfolio as well. So this is one article when we were awarded the grant. Of course, here's another article when we went to the Virginia Capitol. They were meeting with their own district representatives. You can see on the right, now these were teams of like five to eight. They represent the whole sixth grade, so we let them practice and stream their presentations back from the VC Rice River Center with feedback, like a shark tank, so even the whole school can participate. But when they went to the Capitol, it's a representative team, and it's a different team each year, but you're seeing one of the schools, and they have that infographic where they were meeting with their representative who's in the middle of that group for their district at the Agricultural Committee. And each of the districts got to do that. And they, so you talk about the impression. And then here's two examples of the infographic up close. This is Newport News. You can see the field study data collection in the middle where they were looking at water quality. And then you look at the stewardship action plan on the right and they're gonna do oysters. They partnered with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and they're growing that spat and putting those cages, you know, back into the river themselves. Um, this one is from New Kent Middle School and it's more of a rural area. And the picture in the lower left, um, it doesn't have to be so complex. The other people, they're going out on kayaks and dumping oysters back in sanctuaries, really good. If you wanna go simple, these people, it, when I, sim I say simplistic elegance, it doesn't mean that it's not impactful, but they were doing rain gardens because they had a lot of runoff even on their own local school grounds. And that picture on the lower left shows those big dirt spots. So they're gonna do rain gardens and then use, you know, harvest food and put that back into the community. Okay, so I'm looking at my time, a couple of minutes left, and that's good. I think I've got it timed right. This is a screen capture when we took the students after they met with their local representatives. Um, this is a picture from the floor of the Virginia Capitol. There's two houses, the, the uh, state house and then the senators, and you can see them clapping. They're looking up at us. And if you look at the LCD panels on both sides of that image, um, that's one group of the students, one of the schools, and we're, they're getting acknowledged. It was a proclamation. It was red, they stand up, they get acknowledged. And there's videos of this. The Virginia Capitol actually created it and we post those on our site. And if you think of the impact that the students and the teachers, the affirmation they get from the districts and the PTA and their administrators, it's huge. Here's a blurrier picture looking up. For, I just captured it as a screen capture from the live video. So it looks a little blurry here of the students themselves. And you see them pulling out their cell phones on the left. Those are, that's the STEM coordinator and the teacher. And they know this is a moment. And there's an African-American lady on the right with her green phone that was with us as well, Acacia McKenna. They know that's a moment and they're capturing that too. So um, real quickly, I want to give a big shout out to our team. The graduate students um, are Jack Ryan and Casey Johnson. They're unfortunately not in this image, but here's our co-PIs. I was the PI and Sue Kirk who helped pull it together. And then the Oyster Shell Recycling, a big shout out there. So. There's only, I don't think I have time for maybe one minute, but if you have questions, what I'll do is, um, here's my content information, but you have that in the handout. So I'm gonna stop sharing, figure out how to do that and get back into the, uh, say goodbye. <laughs> so just a sec, close it out. Okay, so I, I think that's my time. And until they kick me off, if you have a question or something, happy to do that. I'm glancing at the chat now. Nice STEM project and presentation. Thank you, Steve. Thank you there, Al. You're good there. So as always, appreciate it. I love that you're getting all those little thumbs up there. So it's always nice to see and encouraging. So again, um, Al, I'm just going to ask you at some point to kind of loop back into that discussion piece because there's still some more questions and comments there. I'd love for you to check those out as well, too. Well, thank you, Kelly. Thanks, everybody. Take All care. right. Thank you, everyone. So we're just getting.